Hi, everyone, and, and welcome to our panel uh, entitled COVID-19 Playing the Long Game. Few people watching this panel will be surprised to hear that the coronavirus pandemic is indeed going to continue to be a very long game. South by Southwest is taking place almost to the day on the one year anniversary of when many Americans first experienced their first stay at home order. The virus has already been circulating in the United States for almost 13 months. And judging by the fact that you're watching this from behind your computer screen, it will continue to circulate in the country for the foreseeable future for quite some time. And so we're here today to talk about what that future will look like and how researchers and global health leaders and the broader public are still in a position to influence the virus's trajectory ahead. So I'll first introduce myself. My name is Emily Baumgartner and I'm a national correspondent at the Los Angeles Times. I focus on science and medicine. I have had the privilege of covering infectious disease outbreaks in the past, mainly in other regions of the world, but uh, the thrilling job over the past year of covering the coronavirus outbreak in the United States for the LA Times. So, so joining me today, we have three panelists. I'm gonna let you know who they are and then allow them to introduce themselves as well. First, we have Hans Kierstedt, the chairman and chief executive officer of Avita Biomedical. We have Tom Lane, the chancellor's professor at the Institute for Immunology at the University of California, Irvine, and Mark DeGroote, the CEO of Pattern Pharma. So before we dive in, I would love for each of you to introduce yourselves briefly. Let us know in a couple sentences how you interfaced with the pandemic over the past year, what your role was, and how your career leading up till now prepared you for this experience and this, this moment in our country and in our world. We can start with you, Tom, and then we can go around to Hans and then Mark. Sure, thanks, Emily, for that very kind introduction. Um, as Emily said, I'm a professor of uh, neurobiology and at the Institute of Immunology at UC Irvine. Um, I've been doing coronavirus research for over two decades, uh, primarily focusing on mouse coronaviruses and their ability to infect and replicate within the central nervous system. And so, um, on the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2, my lab has pivoted and we have a very robust program now studying uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection of susceptible mice with uh, the idea of testing novel antivirals as well as anti-inflammatories. But in particular, we're very curious about the neuroinvasive aspects of SARS-CoV-2 and hoping to learn from that to extrapolate this information for humans. My name's Hans Kierstedt. I'm the chairman and CEO of Avita Biomedical. I'm a typically trained neuroscientist, assistant, associate, and full professor at the University of California at Irvine, some 15 years. Um, I no longer work there. I'm a serial entrepreneur um, of three prior stories that generated a good, strong re return on investment to uh, uh, those around me and to my investors, and more importantly, the treatments worked. Uh, lastly, I've advised the governments of the United States and Canada, Japan, China, Bahamas, and Panama regarding cellular therapy laws, and then the translation of those laws into various regulatory policies at their respective FDAs. And now I run Avita with four clinical trials in the United States and Japan, testing a vaccine for cancer. And when COVID-19 hit, you know, it didn't take me long to bolt up in bed at three o'clock in the morning and think, I run a vaccine company, I should probably think about a vaccine for COVID-19. And so my team and I have been working furiously over the last year, developing and testing in humans a vaccine for COVID-19. Great. Um so I'm Mark de Groot. I'm the CEO of Pattern Pharma. My training has been in academic research in the hard sciences, uh, though I've since been involved in the life sciences industry uh, over a number of decades. In this context, I've set up and run a number of biotech companies, uh, particularly immunotherapeutics companies. Uh, I've also set up and run a life sciences venture capital fund fo focused on emerging technologies and work for a time at a large pharmaceutical multinational. I'm now running a biotech company, as mentioned, called Pattern Pharma, which I set up fairly recently with a longtime scientific collaborator. 
Our focus at Patton Pharma is on developing pharmaceutical grade botanical drugs that harness the innate immune system to combat infectious diseases and cancers. Hence our mission statement, which is making patients innately better. So um, in terms of our involvement with COVID-19, our focus like Hunts's was on uh, oncology applications, in particular, the area of immuno-oncology. However, with the advent of COVID-19 roughly a year ago, uh, we too decided that it made sense for us to look at potential applications of our program and, uh, and in particular our lead, uh, our lead drug, uh, in part because it's, our product is a second generation product and the first generation product has been used extensively on millions of people and particularly against viral diseases and particularly against acute respiratory viral diseases. Uh, in that context, the first generation product has been shown to be effective both as a therapeutic, so treating someone who has COVID-19, but also as a prophylactic. So given on a monthly basis, it's proved very effective, for example, at preventing influenza. So as a result of the uh, situation, we uh, looked very seriously at the uh, potential of uh, launching clinical studies with our program uh, and in that context engaged extensively with the FDA. Um, we have yet to enter into the clinic, although we're still in discussions about how we might do that either in the first world or potentially in the developing world as well. Um, so yes, brief synopsis. Thanks. So, so thanks guys for your introductions. And before we start talking about the long game, I think it's important that we talk about where we are now so we can understand what that will look like. So let's say that the pandemic is a marathon, 26.2 miles. I would love to hear from each of you individually where you think we are in the marathon right now. Um, your answer may be specific to the US or it may be global because I, I recognize those landscapes are very different in the context of the pandemic. I'd like to hear where you think we are now and also how you've arrived at that calculation. And perhaps the most interesting to folks, what does life actually look like at 26.2 miles? However you deem to measure that. So let's start with you, Tom. Uh, I'd say in the US, we're about a quarter of the way into it. That's my estimation. Um, I think we have a lot to learn about the durability of the vaccines in terms of generating sustained memory immune responses. Um, I think we also have to keep a close eye on emerging variants, um, which clearly, you know, now we have the UK variant, the South American variant, and I believe there's a Brazilian variant as well. These undoubtedly will continue to grow. Um, and so we wonder about how nimble uh, vaccine companies are to keep up with these and they, do we need to keep up with these you know I think that remains to be known we don't know if this is going to be a flu-like disease so is it going to be uh, um, seasonal um, we're still in a pandemic so infections are still rising globally so I think we'll turn the page when we, the virus becomes endemic right so that it'll be circulating but uh, we'll have flare-ups, but uh, it's just not gonna be the problem that it is now. So I think we still have a long way to go, but having said that, I'm very confident. I mean, what we've done, what, what the world has done within a, the space of a year, technically less than a year is truly remarkable. So um, I feel good about where we are. Plus I hate so marathons, so uh, <laughs> I'm very conscious about that. <laughs> so, so Tom is putting us between miles six and seven, I think. How about yeah. you, Hans? Yeah. Um, you know, I. it's funny you, you ask a question like this because I've done some uh, events like these things. And I think that we burst out of the gates very recently and we're within that first five miles of euphoria saying we're running this race, we're going to win this race. And we have no idea how we're going to be halfway, three quarters near the end of that race, whether we're not, whether we're going to be sucking air on the side of the road or uh, striding forward confidently. Um, you know, we, we've learned in this last year that we can beat the bug. So that's amazing. So I agree with Tom in that you know, it's we're buoyed as a community of scientists and doctors in knowing now that this bug can be beaten. 
because there's several bugs in the world that we can't beat and we fail that miserably. So it's good news that we can rally biotechnology and nail this thing. But the bad news is that we are very, very early on in this. You see almost every major vaccine producer that's gotten out the gates early now taking a major shift, a major pivot in their approaches. I think we just saw today that Moderna has come up with a different vaccine, probably, for uh, South African variants. Um, AstraZeneca's and Pfizer's, we're seeing some variable results, and they're not sure what they're going to do or how they're going to cope. But we're shifting in our perspectives now towards a flu-like strategy where every year the vaccine is different. We've seen both the rate of infectivity and now in England, we see the rate of mortality changing with these new variants. Who knows what the future is going to bring when we turn that corner on mile 26, by the time we get there, this thing could be completely different from what it is now. And we don't know how we're going to be feeling when we near the end of this race. All right, Hans puts us in the first five miles. That's pretty brutal. How about you, Mark? Um, I, along the similar lines, but I would say that in, uh, so far prognostication has proved to be extremely difficult with this uh, disease. So it's hard to know if we're at mile five, mile 15, possibly mile 17 and a half. It, it, it's, it's a little bit challenging. I suspect we're in the first part of the, the race, that's for sure, first half. Um, and uh, I think there are yet many surprises uh, to be sprung upon us. Uh, at one point, people were expecting there to be no variants. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of definitive scientific pronouncements prove to be completely and utterly wrong. Uh, so I think a lot of people have been wrong footed continually, which I mean, is fine. I think one just needs to make those prognostications with a certain degree of humbleness. Uh, I think people tend to sort of pronounce ex cathedra about the evolution of this disease when it's really very hard to do. And given that it got out so fast uh, out of the starting blocks and became so disseminated. There's a lot more scope for things to veer off in unexpected directions, whether it's new variants, uh, whether it's uh, other issues. That being said, yes, I too am very sanguine. I think it's been extraordinary, the progress, which actually nobody would have believed. In fact, the leading vaccine candidates, most many people thought would not work at all. They were completely and utterly unproven up until uh, the announcements unproven against any disease. <laughs> so it's kind of remarkable that they're as effective as they are. We're learning more about them that, you know, for example, there's a pretty high degree of efficacy just from a single injection, uh, whether it's 85% efficacy with the, the Pfizer vaccine uh, and some of the other ones uh, are similarly effective just with a single dose. So that's kind of allowing more flexibility in terms of administration regimens, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in short, hard to know exactly where we're in the race, but I think we're running strongly and <laughs> we'll, we'll obviously press on. <laughs> Great. Um, several of you touched on on variants, and I want to I want to kind of take our conversation in that direction. And I think that variants are one of the main question on people's minds. People who have, have not experienced pandemics in the past and have not studied up on what pandemics would be like, um, we're in a winter at the, the degree of evolution that can occur and how it happens. Um, we know that that the coronavirus will continue to evolve and mutate in the coming months, not because we always try to be careful about this, not because it's intellectually plotting against the human race, but because that is what viruses do. And upon occasion, those random errors in, in the replication process give the virus new advantages over our defenses. So, so I would love to hear from each of you, as vaccine developers think about potential methods to sort of keeping up with this virus, Walk us through what you think sort of the overarching game plan is 
um, for, for facing these variants and what it's going to look like. Um, a couple of you mentioned in your last answer, it's going to look different based on the, the model. The RNA vaccines are gonna do things differently than other vaccines, but just give us the overarching idea of, of what do you do when you have variants circulating and you already have vaccines in people's arms? Any of you that, that wanna jump in, feel free. We can go in any order. Okay, I can I can start us off. You know, I think that what you're speaking to um, underscores the need for contact tracing, which you know the United States has been dismally poor at, and many countries, um, frankly, don't have it um, the game up to scruff yet. If we can actually follow this virus, well, then we can see if it's behaving differently, and that's how a variant is first. If there's an outbreak somewhere then the geneticists get in there and sequence it. So we're going to need a lot more tracing initially so that we can actually see the new behaviors and report them, follow them, see their spreads. And uh, that does take a lot of coordination and coordination across nations. Because of travel, et cetera, it's very difficult to know points of origin. You know, that's getting easier now as travel's at an all-time low. But with vaccinations coming out that are partially effective, perhaps no longer with a new variant, we're going to see the travel becoming something that spreads variants internationally quickly. It's very soon. So contact tracing, who gets it, how did they get it, looking more uh, in a sophisticated manner at the rate of spread and mortality in particular areas. And then coupling that with a, a better system of rolling out new variant vaccines. So for example, with our vaccine, we need a little piece of recombinant, rebuilt, artificially built, proteins that look like the bug and what its new variants are. It takes a little while to generate them. It takes a longer while to get them through the regulatory system. Same thing with mRNA vaccines, very short period of time to make them, very long period of time to get them through the regulatory process. So we are going to need the partnership of regulatory bodies, the respective FDAs around the world, in order to expedite the testing and approvals. And I, I wanted to underscore what a double-edged sword that is. Because if you move fast, we can vaccinate and we can take care of variants. If you move too slowly, then you get, um, uh, I'm sorry, if you moved too fast, I mean to say, then you get a, uh, you know, you get safety problems. You, you end up vaccinating massive amounts of people with a vaccine that may cause tremendous harm. And every time this world, this community of ours has tackled an epidemic or a pandemic, uh, we have done as a community tremendous amounts of hurt until the next generations of vaccines come to take care of that hurt, to refine the medicines. I, I would add uh, to this that, you know, a lot of these studies with the variants um, are intriguing. They're, they're often using um, convalescent serum from patients that have, uh, you know, been infected, right? And so the convalescent antibody responses are muted. They cover about 50% protection. Um, and so, you know, I think we need more information on how vaccinated individuals, what their antibody responses are to these variants. But then keep in mind, you know, I think in some ways we're putting a lot too, in maybe too much emphasis on the antibody response. There's a really nice paper that came out of Sean, Shane Crotty's group recently, um, earlier this month from the La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology. And it was the first comprehens comprehensive analysis of not only the antibody response in COVID patients, but also T cells and B or memory responses, right? And antibody responses wane over time, but they actually have a very robust uh, memory B cell response that stays intact. And they have memory T cell responses, they wane a bit. So, you know, um, variants happen and that's inevitable as you pointed out, um, but the other thing to keep in, in mind is that often if you have new vaccines that are developed, if you immunize people that have already been immunized, 
many times all you're doing is boosting the initial immune response to the initial vaccine. All right, you do get an antibody response or an immunological response to the subsequent vaccine. But I think these things need to be worked out. And I think we need to be very cautious how fast we move forward. And that's to Hans's point. Uh, two points uh, with regards to variants. One is uh, the FDA in particular has just announced uh, their plan for accelerated approvals of modified versions of existing approved vaccines. And uh, these, I think, are sound very sensible and they will also allow a much, much higher cadence in terms of the development of fresh vaccines. And presumably they are going to apply across the board, no matter what type of modality. Um, and so the approach basically is that rather than insisting on a new efficacy test or uh, i.e. effectiveness test or a new safety test, what they will do is just take a few hundred healthy volunteers, look for similar kind of immunological responses or immune responses, and um, as compared the, to the previous generation one, and then it'll take about two months. So I think, you know, given the type of vaccines we now have, it's going to be pretty straightforward, maybe six months from now, nine months from now, to really just substitute the latest sort of variant du jour uh, if we get into that scenario. I, mean, I don't think we know yet whether we're going to have sort of these sequences of variants or uh, or we have four so far or, you know, where, where, where it's exactly it's going to go. But anyway, I think that's a hopeful sign. So there really is a regulatory response, which will allow much, much, much quicker turnarounds. Um, the other kind of approach is one that that we are interested in at sort of Patent Pharma, which really leverages the power of the innate immune system. So this is uh, the immune system split into innate and adaptive. The adaptive immune system tends to get all the press, you know, antibodies and the T cells, et cetera. However, it doesn't uh, work without the innate immune system, which is evolutionarily very ancient. It's about a billion years old. Uh, even before we split off from plants. And so uh, I think if you kind of, that's maybe another part of the solution is targeting the innate immune system uh, in order to basically beef up the front line because they, the innate immune system is the front line, the first responders against all viral diseases, bacterial diseases, and cells that are going rogue and becoming cancerous. So I think that's an, also an interesting avenue for the future. Yeah, but I, I let me ask you a question to Hans. I'm sorry. I hope I. Um, no, Tom, please. Um, so, Hans and Mark, do you think that these subsequent trials with uh, any um, new variant vaccines, we're not going to go through the classic phase one, phase two, phase three? Yes. We're going to be expedited based yep. on our knowledge yep. base, right? I think they have to guidance. Yeah. But then, you know, the whole point of a vaccine is uh, I, I certainly truly appreciate your uh, notion on the innate immune responses. And what yeah. we've learned a lot about people that have had problems with COVID is they have genetic deficiencies and type 1 interferon responses, et cetera, right. et cetera. And that's been yeah. extremely informative with regards to why some people potentially get much worse. Right. But at the end of the day, you still want a vaccine. And the whole purpose is immunological memory. And that's derived, you know, as you know, from... The, your B cell and T cell responses. Uh, yeah, just to kind of briefly address that. So as, as you know, Tom, so the innate immune system, particularly dendritic cells are really the interface to the adaptive immune system. And what we've seen with our product, for example, is that you can create an, what they call an in situ vaccine. So basically by administering something which upregulates the innate immune system, you upregulate the dendritic cells, which are these gatekeepers to the adaptive immune system, and you can get a long-term memory effects. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's possibilities, shall we say. Sure, great. <laughs> Um, I just want to jump on with a quick, quick question. Um, I'm surprised no one mentioned this, but if we go further upstream in this process with, with addressing variants, Hans, you mentioned contact tracing. Um, I want to ask you guys about surveillance. I want to understand, do you, wh what do you think about the U.S., the current state of U.S. surveillance um, on a national comprehensive level? What, what letter grade would you give to the CDC given the, the recent um, upgrades they've made in, in this process, but how much how much work needs to be done on surveillance for us to actually get an adequate 
read on on what variants are circulating, where they're circulating, as you mentioned, Hans, and and therefore be able to inform um, the development and the upgrade of vaccines moving forward. You know, I think we went from a situation of F minus to perhaps a C within the last six months. Sure. And, uh, it's been, and, you, and you're right in that the contact tracing and surveillance really go hand in hand. You need both clearly, and one leads to the other. But, um, you know, you really do need a very sophisticated uh, set of um, surveillance um, geneticists really looking at uh, quickly sequencing and thank goodness we can do that as a community quite quickly now but i think we still have a way to go you know i think we're kind of right around a c as a grade right now which is a huge change from f over the last year <laughs> where is where is the uk are they an a plus are they a, an a minus you know smaller countries so they're actually have done better of late than the united states has because it's a it's a more constrained geography. So they've done a lot better than the United States lately. Great. So, sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, I would agree with Hans's perspective on that. Yeah, nothing to add. <laughs> wow, consensus. That's great. So, <laughs> So a quick question. Um, I want to I want to change gears a little bit, but um, I, I want to talk to you guys about this this concept of vaccine nationalism. We've talked about it a little bit a bit in past discussions, and I'm intrigued by it because I think, especially at the timing that that this particular conference is coming up, billions of people, countries representing billions of people, still haven't seen a single vaccine in certain regions of the world. So there are obviously lots of reasons that public health experts caution against this, this concept of vaccine nationalism that wealthy countries are buying up and have, have purchased a disproportionate amount of vaccines, leaving not very much for other countries. Um, before I ask my question, I wanna step back and just give a little bit of context for anyone who hasn't followed this closely. This connects to variants because one obvious reason to, to object to a country hoarding vaccines, even purely um, from, say, a U.S.-centric perspective, is that as long as the virus is, is raging anywhere in the world, it has an increased number of opportunities to mutate into strains that could then overcome our defenses, whether it's natural immunity or vaccines, and that could launch sort of a fresh outbreak of, of a new variant. So how that would play out is that if, you know, if the U.S. is vaccinated, um, almost every citizen at some point, but a strain arises elsewhere in, let's say, 2022 or 2023 that could overcome one of the RNA vaccines, for example, in 80% in of recipients, then the U.S. would not be positioned very well. Um, so with that context, I want to ask you guys about, you know, what are some of the reasonable arguments for not going global just yet? Obviously, a lot of global leaders, um, even the Biden administration is, is weighing loads of different factors, whether it's economic frugality, et cetera. You know, what are the factors that, that officials have to take into account um, when they weigh how much vaccine to distribute elsewhere, how much to keep for themselves, and what can be done to address the long-term distribution challenges? Um, even if we don't frame this as a moral issue or an ethical issue, um, epidemiologically, how do we address this in the long run? Boy, that's a, you know, you've raised a number of really interesting questions there, Emily. And I tell you, I, I've been looking at this a lot as we are uh, setting up manufacturing facilities on both sides of the world, literally uh, Indonesia, half a world away and here in the United States. And I think what we're seeing is that every country is in economic depression right now because of their lack of a workforce, closing borders, uh, tourism down, uh, everything. And um, so it's right now we're at a stage early in that marathon where everyone's trying to get on the list of the vaccine distributors because each of them have a centralized manufacturing facility that's worth billions of dollars. And that's very, very hard for most countries to replicate. You even have very wealthy countries, you know, Saudi Arabia, um, other areas like that, that just don't have a major scientific community there. They just haven't built it. They buy it generally. And so um, there's a lot of reasons 
poor or extreme concentrations of wealth where acquisitions, the way that you get your medicines, that leads to this gross decentralization. And most, the vast majority of countries in the world do not have these centralized manufacturing facilities. So they just got to get on a list. And I think what you're going to see over the next few years is that countries like Indonesia, for example, that haven't developed their own vaccine yet, they're doing it now, are thinking, I'm going to be paying out billions and billions of dollars every year. And the presidents, prime ministers of the world, kings, are now looking at the redistribution of wealth on a completely different scale and duration than they ever have before. If you keep paying Pfizer, it's going to America, et cetera. So do you want all of your money being drained off year by year? So we really do have inequity here. And it's it's two-sided. Does an American company like Pfizer distribute and in what manner do they distribute and what level of equality socioeconomically? And then it's the other side of it where the countries that don't have a vaccine producer, can they actually get their own? So in Avita Biomedical, what we did, this very conundrum that you brought up led me to hypothesize a completely different strategy where we let the country, any country that wants to generate a vaccine in their own country using our technologies. So we sell these little kits to make the vaccines. They can be actually produced within any country using their own supply chain. So we can purchase usually 80 to 90% of these kit components within Indonesia or Singapore or Germany or wherever. And that allows a country to have an economic stimulus within their country as they deploy funds for vaccine production within their own country, rather than having a leaky border economically and seeing their wealth dissipate over time. So we're going to see major, major shifts of both money in the short term, but then an awakening where biotech is going to be elevated in every country because there's no way that a country like Indonesia could ever survive for very long, putting out six billion a year, year after year after year outside of their borders. They must build. And indeed, that's what we're doing in Indonesia, allowing them to build their own vaccine. So I think we're gonna see that shift towards homegrown, which requires a long-term commitment to biotechnology. And then in vaccine producers, a shift like mine, where we actually are set up to allow countries that don't have multi-billion dollar infrastructures to make the vaccine at the point of care in their own country and have a supply chain that is redundant and within their own country. Mark, you had a thought? Yes, um, sort of in the same vein. So um, here in uh, Canada, when I'm come from Toronto, calling from Toronto, um, it's been a real eye-opener because Canada has been sort of insourcing or outsourcing, I guess, rather, uh, from abroad all its vaccines. It used to have a more substantial manufacturing capability, still does to some extent, but doesn't have these cutting edge technologies for sure, like mRNA and uh, adenovirus vector technologies, which to be fair, have come to the fore recently. So in any case, this has caused a real sort of uh, rethink, I would say, about the need to consider such manufacturing capabilities as a strategic resource that you really should have. Uh, and so this is not a developing world country, but, but a kind of a, a developed country where this has hit home in a very significant manner. And it's had a the lack of facilities coupled with vaccine nationalism has caused issues in terms of vaccine procurement. Uh, so that, that again, is sort of being seen firsthand here. I think we're sort of we're in an interesting situation where unexpectedly there are a significant number of vaccines that are remote, working remarkably well. Uh, and so they're going to be scoped for different kind of approaches. Certainly there's sort of vaccine diplomacy underway. If you look, for example, at the Sputnik V vaccine, uh, which, you know, is working very well. Uh, 
as the publications in the Lancet recently, et cetera, are testament to that. Um, there is a you know, well-defined plan indeed to set up manufacturing facilities in diff many different places around the world. And, uh, and it's sort of this vaccine diplomacy kind of going on. Uh, you look at um, India, for example. So with the Serum Institute, they've become a major manufacturer of vaccines for, for the world in principle, except now they too are you know, going to be obliged to first provide their product locally within India before they can start shipping it elsewhere. So going to be many different models. Um, I think overall that given the focus on scaling up manufacturing and the fact, for example, that more recently you've seen different pharmaceutical companies joining together, whether willingly or at the behest of their national governments to manufacture, for example, the Pfizer vaccine or the uh, uh, you know, AstraZeneca vaccine, et cetera, there's also going to be a lot of capacity coming on stream. I mean, I think towards the end of this year, we'll really have millions of doses um, of, of product just given the current increase. So, you know, that's it's going to be interesting to see how that sort of plays out. Not guaranteed, but I think there's a chance that that will be the case. Can I ask a question? Because, I mean, it's great having Hans and Mark here because they have a great perspective on this. What, um, and then Emily also, you could, I, I, so just today, I think COVAX, which is the WHO's, WHO's vaccine distribution, I think they just announced that they distributed the AstraZeneca vaccine to Ghana, right? Yeah. And so this is kind of touches on, I think, the question you raised to some extent, right, Emily, that um, how is how are these countries that might not be able to participate uh, so well, are they benefiting from this? So do you think this is a... Um, is this a mechanism by which it could facilitate or more rapidly, um, you know, spread these vaccines globally to countries that might not have access to them? Well, I, I'm going to answer your question with a question because I've, yeah. I've heard a lot of um, concern that that COVAX has its limits. Um, okay. I don't know what what the rest of you think about this. I think um, it's a it's a I had one researcher tell me it's it's really swimming against the tide of history. It's a very unprecedented approach. Um, we haven't had a, a moment like this in the past, you know, a hundred yeah. years when when such a thing has been instituted and instituted well. And at least in the early stages of it, Covax really did, um, in no secret way, struggle to gain the funding and the the vaccines that were necessary. Um, moving forward, I think when I say I'll answer a question with a question. I'm, I'm eager to hear um, when, when several of you have mentioned vaccine diplomacy, um, this is, it's difficult to argue with the, the idea that this is one of the most powerful soft power tools mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the past, I don't know how many decades you'd say. Um, yeah. This is an incredibly powerful tool in a vial. Right. Um, it, yeah. We cannot talk about this without talking about China and Russia. Um, you know, even just hearing you mentioned Sputnik. So I'm yep. curious whether um, whether you all think, even in the presence of COVAX or perhaps in supplement to COVAX um, or in competition with, with the model that COVAX suggests, how, how is it going for China and Russia? Is this soft power tool working to their benefit? Did they pull ahead while the US was focused on a bit of a more self-centered approach to this? And, and is there a way that the US can sort of get in the running in terms of vaccine diplomacy? Perhaps I'll just jump in and then hand it over to Hans. Right. Um, so on the on the Russian side, which I know quite well for historical reasons, I think it's certainly going very well in the sense that uh, a lot of dividends are being sort of you know reaped by uh, the Russians, the Russian state, if you like. Uh, it, it's been very well perceived this soft diplomacy, as you were saying, and this willingness to transfer manufacturing, etc. Um, so I, you know, I, that's clearly going to have a, a, a big impact. It's interesting to note that Hungary, which is within the European Union, has a, is administering the Sputnik V vaccine, even though it hasn't gone through the EU regulatory approval process. And they just started, it was either today or yesterday, I think, the, um, the Sinovac, the, the Chinese vaccine, also in Hungary. So, so countries are kind of going it alone and are basically not waiting for the central regulators to weigh in, or at least in certain instances are going alone. It's not really a mass movement. 
So I, I think overall this, this, and we see this in many, many spheres, this, this pandemic has shaken up sort of pre-existing structures in a dramatic way. And the impact of this in particularly in pharmaceuticals, life sciences, biotech, health, and many, many other spheres, of course, but in those in particular, will be felt for decades. I mean, there's been a lot of significant changes wrought over the last year, and it's not over uh, for sure. Yeah, I'll only add to that um, the the concept of um, economic stability, and we're going to shift. Right now, we're looking at reallocation of money. So you've got to pay China for those vaccines, and there's no way around that. It, you're, it's one thing to fight for access to it, because everyone's very desperate trying, trying to put their economically distressed company back to work, country, back mm -hmm. to work. Uh, companies, everything. Um, so they're they're trying to get in line. There's a whole lot of politicking going on in order to get at the front of the line and gain that vaccine. But when you dial us ahead a couple of years, you know what you're looking at is a redisposition of cash that's just never seen been seen before, and the leverage that it takes. I want your ports. I want your air. Uh, space to fly over for my military in exchange for provision of vaccines. This type of international diplomacy is not all sweet. Can I get at the front of the line? It's very, very hard because these countries are bleeding dollars out of their borders and they cannot sustain that for very long. So I think right now we're in a period where um, the countries of the world are waking up thinking, okay, this is a long standing thing and we need to be able to make our own vaccine. We need to be able to access it and we need to be able to do so in a way that um, we need to partner because these good vaccines are hard to make. You know, there's very, look at how we've been at this a year and we have just a handful of decent vaccines and the data is all over the place. It's Sinovac came out with 100% efficacy and then they went to 85%. And then the Brazil study said, no, 50%. And so the data is jumping up and down all over the place. And uh, what we have is going to, you can't lie in, in medicine and biology for very long. You can, but not for very long. Because we're a community that just seeks out truth. And we have big numbers here. So we can get hugely significant uh, conclusions. And all of that is coming. I think we're going to see a pruning down of vaccines over the next five to 10 years to be not few vaccines, but a pruning down of the technologies that work. And then a distribution of manufacturing centers because of this uh, regional economic decline that I was mentioning. Um, you're mentioning, when, when you talk about some of this data, um, it, it reminds me of a point I wanted to bring up with you all and get your, your opinion on. When we talk about the statistics surrounding these things, so many readers write into the LA Times, I've had this experience four times already this week, asking questions about how we can or whether we can compare efficacy data. And I don't mean numbers jumping around for one specific vaccine based on the, the pool of information we have available, but the changes that we'll see over time. So I want to ask you, you know, taking into account, of course, the context that's necessary is that the goal of a vaccine by and large is to prevent severe infection. We want to keep people out of the ICU so that when you get into a car accident, there's a bed for you in the ICU that will also bring down these rates much more than we care about preventing a cough or a headache for a couple of days. So taking that into account, knowing that about efficacy data, can we compare efficacy data across different vaccines that were tested in non-identical pools of people? Um, if we can, how do we do it and should we do it? It's a question from the general public even, you know, imagining that they had vaccines to choose from. You know, my, I'll jump in. Um, you can't now, but you will be able to later. So these studies in phase three clinical trials are roughly 30,000 people, sometimes up to 45,000 people. And you vaccinate half, half get a placebo, and then you look for the incidence of infection. But it takes you a full year to start to get a handle on the duration of protection and the severity of disease that you get, even if you're vaccinated. So 
it, these are early, early days. I think that we will be able to over time if we stick to that measure of um, disease. So if you're measuring the severity or the incidence of disease, we are going to be able to get that. But it's going to take, even with the current vaccines, years. And with the pace of the mutations, we're going to be getting new vaccines onto the market and into hundreds of millions of people like we have now before we even know that data before we can even predict uh, uh, which one's going to be better, certainly before we can statistically compare one to the other. That, that being said, um, if I can jump in, uh, you know, the countries that are running country scale experiments, such as Israel, uh, where they, I think they've so far vaccinated about 2.6 plus million people, uh, and, you know, those are the numbers that start to give you or, or sizes of trial sizes that give you reliable numbers. And, uh, you know, there's, there's interesting data coming out of that. For example, not too long ago, that 80, you got 85 percent protection against uh, developing symptomatic COVID-19 from just the first shot of the Pfizer vaccine. That's you know pretty useful data because now people can start public health officials can start to plan that you know maybe you want to actually just give one to twice as many people as opposed to two to half that number. I mean you can model it, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's it is hard as Hans was saying to, to gather that data, but in some cases we're seeing these interesting countrywide sort of experiments on the way. There are isolated incidents. Do you remember the uh, you know the cruise ship? Incident, yes, yeah, Korea incident, which has uh, you know it's a very protected population. You yeah. know, you know the spread of COVID. Some of our greatest data came out of those very few instances. Yeah. Right, we had a contained environment, and mm -hmm. Israel is certainly one of them for it. Yeah, and it's interesting with Israel that you know they had no manufacturing capability, as I understand it. Mm -hmm yet was somehow able to secure or tremendous, you know, uh, hats off to the people who were very proactive getting out there early and getting access to it and, and you know, benefiting their population. So it's, it's interesting dynamic where we're, everybody's got to work out a way forward. <laughs> to yeah, secure it's, money, money. it's money and strategic advantage, you know? Yeah. 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 And I, I think politics. Yeah. Right. And I think one of the things that Israel sort of offered was that, indeed, it could be a laboratory for a very large scale sort of clinical study. Uh, and I, I think that was actually part of it, as I, as I understand. So interesting kind of ways of doing things. But I think and it is. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. But, but I think, you know, everything right now, everything was focused on efficacy. Right. So, you know, so are we getting protection from disease? Are we limiting spread? And then more importantly, what we don't know, and this gets back to what Hans and uh, Mark mentioned is the durability and of the immune response, right? Are we enhancing antibody responses and T cell responses? And I think as time goes by, what we're really gonna learn is um, differences in um, racial disparities in vaccination rates, right? Access to these vaccinations, um, do uh, Latinx, black American or black people, do they have the same type of durable antibody or vaccine response as other populations? Age, is that a factor? We're gonna find all these things out, right? And so we are so still so early in these processes. And, and so everybody's just been fixated on protection, understandably so, because we need to get this into the population. As time goes by, we'll be able to recalibrate and get much better data sets where we can bin this information out mm -hmm. and then perhaps tailor these immune responses to different populations. Yeah, Tom, you know, following up on that, you know, many of the vaccine producers excluded the difficult types of patients in order to yeah. increase the perceived efficacy. So if you exclude, exclude older people and you exclude people with pre-existing conditions, for example, your numbers look better because younger people don't contract disease as much as uh, or the severity of and so we're also restricted there and there's an inability to compare one trial to another because of their inclusion and exclusion criteria i think that's a very key point 
A lot of the numbers Mark is mentioning that are coming out of Israel, I think, are helpful in that regard. You know, the the, the sample that we're looking at now out of Israel yeah. is half a million people. It's over 500,000 people with various, you know, various um pre-existing conditions that affects the efficacy in some ways, but the numbers were by and large quite similar to what we saw in clinical trials. And keep in mind that the Pfizer clinical trial phase three um, was 20,000 20, people. So this is a huge increase in the number of people that we're looking at. Yeah. I think you're yeah. right. It'll, it'll be a, a, a laboratory for us to look at in that regard. It's, I'm glad we're pre-recording this because I believe that information is embargoed for another half hour. So by the time they release this, um, it'll be out there. But I totally agree. I think Israel's a prime way of, of seeing what it would look like in the long term. But of course, that, that kind of set of information um, is only available in places with really great records, really great health records that are, that are collective in a, in a way that is centralized. So. Yeah. And, and just on the Israel front, so um, you know, it's about 500,000 who have had this two doses but there are many more who've had just one dose and that's allowing them to draw these inferences about the efficacy of just one dose at, at roughly 85%. So um, lots, they've been very active, <laughs> I would say. It's, it's, it's an example to, to us all. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna switch gears because we've got a lot to cover here. Um, let's talk a little bit about long haulers. Um, as, we, as we step back and look at the long game here in the U.S., um, it would, we would be remiss not to discuss what, what is happening with long haulers. Um, my personal background in this, my, my past um, experience that led me to wonder about this early in the pandemic was when I covered the, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, following that, um, huge issues appeared um, in Liberia, Sierra Leone, in Guinea, regarding regarding post Ebola syndrome, some of these these similar conditions. Some of the concern, of course, was about viral persistence in those immune privileged pockets of the body, but but in some ways it really was joint pain, muscle pain, um, vision issues, hearing issues, all of these things, memory loss, neurological issues, all on top of. Um, what we would think of as just the trauma, the experience of the trauma collectively and as individual patients. So um, knowing that this is a completely different virus with completely different effects, um, what would you say to people who are wondering what, what this landscape of long haulers will look like in the U.S. and what the, what the personal experience might look like for those who are, who are dealing with it themselves or know someone else who is? Hmm. Interesting question. You know, I, I think that this is something that, I'm, that should be brought up and discussed more often because, you know, some 50% of Americans don't want to get the vaccine. And uh, when you ask why, they have various answers. Some of them are ridiculous and silly, and some of them are, be, you know, very founded. Their, their uh, mate, their loved one went through a terrible time of side effects, perhaps, and they just don't feel like getting it. <laughs> But a very large percent of them won't get it because they say, you know, I'll just get the disease. I'm not, I'm at a good age. I'll just uh, catch it and then I'll get immunity. And um, what they're missing is the severity of the non-clinical effects. So even people who aren't experiencing, you know, outward uh, demise of loss of sense of smell and the terrible headaches and down in bed and some memory loss or whatever it is, even if they are asymptomatic, what that actually means is subclinical. When you look at those people, more than half of them have respiratory distress. It's just that they're not running marathons and so they don't realize it. A huge and very concerning uh, proportion of people who suffered COVID have advanced brain aging. So, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, I've been watching this, and it's extraordinary. You know, I read a very, very good scientific publication that posited that COVID-19 survivors have aged their brain by approximately 10 years. And you don't notice that now, but you sure do notice that in your 70s and 80s, as, you know, the, all of us get Alzheimer's. It's just that most of us get it after we die, so to speak. It's a progression. And we, you know, Alzheimer's is just advanced aging, for example. And you don't want your brain to age prematurely. You don't want to put some extra miles on that thing that you don't need to. So these subclinical uh, conditions um, 
are part of what you're talking about of long haulers. There are half the people out there that catch COVID that you would say are asymptomatic. They're not. They are actually, they're long haulers themselves. Almost everybody that gets COVID-19 can be a long hauler in one way or another. It's just that their symptoms are subclinical. So it's another reason to get people vaccinated to decrease right. the people that can catch this because, you know, although you may be young and you may be, you know, tough and recalcitrant to these, you know, really, really deleterious effects that we see in the aged, you aren't going to be young forever. And this bug is going to be around forever. And your immune system, just three days of working late, you're stressed out, eating poorly. Even if you're in your 30s, your immune system can become tremendously decreased in its efficiency to fight the bug. And you might as well be an 85-year-old person. And that's why we're seeing deaths amongst young and severe symptoms amongst young. They just, it, the bug happened to catch them at a down moment. Well, I think, uh, I mean, Emily, you point out the Ebola survivors, but, you know, this goes back to even 1918, the uh, influenza pandemic, right? There are a lot of at least neurologic complications associated with those individuals that survived. And um, I think the good thing now, good thing, but uh, that it's now truly being recognized as, as a legitimate clinical problem. It's the, I think the two main issues that a lot of patients complain are brain fog, right? And that, that, you know, it covers a lot. And then fatigue, massive fatigue, right? And it's certainly a myriad of symptoms. But I know that UC Davis, for example, and I think Mount Sinai, their departments of neurology have dedicated clinics now that yeah. are focusing on these long haulers. Oh, and nice. I, I know that more uh, universities and, and, you know, research uh, oriented universities are focusing on these sorts of things. But, you know, one of the main problems is to what you brought up, we don't know if the virus is persisting in the brain because we don't know how well the virus gets in the brain. And I think one of the key problems here is we have to develop more relevant clinical, preclinical animal models, right? So that we can really better understand this. And so how do you treat, you know, brain fog? So what is brain fog? What causes that? That could be caused by a variety of different things. You know, cytokine storms elaborated in the lungs. If you have chronic lung damage, as Hans pointed out, that has a tremendous um, um, problems to the CNS, right? These soluble cytokines get into the CNS and they can really um, alter the landscape of normal cell function. It's irrefutable, right? And so, um, you know, from my perspective, that's one of the key things that we're trying to uh, figure out in my lab. Um, but, you know, the mouse model, the mouse models right now are not good. Uh, they're, they're good for lung pathology, but they're not good for studying long-term effects. You can potentially do this in non-human primates, but that as Mark and Hans can, I, I would assume agree with, those are challenging models. You have to be at the right place and doing this and they're, they're very hard experiments. So the field really has to tailor itself to doing this, right. getting better models. But just to connect them, sorry, go, ahead. go Quick, quick comment, Mark, that we've got to wrap up. Okay, good. I was going to say what's interesting is the recent development where they're now doing challenge studies in the UK. So they're actually giving human volunteers the virus, which is kind of unusual, but uh, yeah. will certainly yeah. yield interesting data. <laughs> so that, that the ultimate animal model, of course, is the human, and they are now seem to be using human animal models to gather data. So that's an interesting development, I think. Yeah. So we've got less than a minute before South by Southwest cuts our wires here. I want to just end with one quick thing. Um, we talk about the long game and, and we all know that once in a while you can find a silver lining in the long game of something like this. The, the, the silver lining I see very obviously is, is the fact that biotech, as has been mentioned, is booming. Tons of money pouring in. Um, if you could each use just one word, couple words, one sentence even to say something you think will be a silver lining of this moving forward, what would you say? You know, I'll, I'll go. I think that we are going to see a, uh, a resurgence and uh, of biotech and a, a an embracing aspect from young people to get into science. 
which in a, is going to have a long lasting increase in the number of scientists in the world and discoveries come from people. I, I would say, um, I think two things is going to make us more, we've been very complacent, um, not recognizing that diseases are infectious diseases are a problem. We've just not had this problem for, you know, decades. It's going to make us be much more nimble in the development of vaccines and dovetailing onto that, it's gonna highlight, uh, hopefully to a lot of people that vaccines are truly one of the greatest advances in medical history uh, and that you know vaccines work. Sort of semi-connected, uh, I would say resilience. I, I think the tools that we have developed are gonna stand us in good stead. And not only with infectious diseases, they're talking about using the same technologies in cancer, et cetera. So it's been a tremendous sort of shot in the arm, so to speak. Uh, for, you know, the biotech industry, the life sciences industry. And global connectivity. Global yeah. connectivity. Global <laughs> connectivity. Guys, yeah. thank you so much for, for joining us. Really appreciate it. It's been great to talk with you all. And thank you to everyone who logged on. We do hope that once it's safe to do so, we can all meet in person. Thanks again and have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. 